was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you Then you called my name You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Your freedom is all that I know The old may knew Jesus when I met you And you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glory Sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my Well, guys, we're going to continue with worship um, for just a, another minute here in bringing our tithes and offerings. And I hope that none of us ever grow impatient or tired of this part of our service. The truth is that if you're a giver and if you've come into that obedience of the tithe, then there is a real joy in this for you. Um, but I want to talk to you just heart to heart for a second and tell you how proud I am of our church. And here's why. During the last six months, churches like seemingly every other part of society have gone through a lot of difficulty and a lot of changes. And you can really measure the health of a church or a business or a family by how well they endure, how well they survive times like this. And I just want to tell you that those of you who are givers, who understand the biblical value of it, who understand the joy of doing it, 
You are what makes Summit possible. You and your faithfulness are what allows us to continue to do ministry uninterrupted and continue to meet the needs of families and meet, meet the needs of our community and meet the needs of our church uninterrupted. And I got to tell you, that is just an enormous load off our staff and off our board that we don't have to scurry and worry and wonder whether we'll be able to continue to do ministry. So I want to tell you how proud I am of our givers, of our tithers, of those who are living in that obedience and trusting God with everything. It is remarkable um, how well this church, how strong we've been during these months. And I just want to thank you for not putting us in jeopardy, but keeping us strong as a church. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray and we'll give together. Father, we give you our worship. We give you our trust and we give you our obedience because in those things, there are always promises of blessing, favor, and reward. Your word says it. We trust it. We believe it. And we give now to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. It is awesome to be back. Welcome to Summit Church Online Campus. We are really, really glad you're here. Last week, of course, uh, Lisa and I were out of town, back in St. Louis visiting my parents and my family there, and uh, we had a great week. And I left you in good hands. If you didn't check out last Sunday's message, please do. Pastor Jack Witt, who's a good friend, but he's a really good communicator, communicates differently than I do. And that's what I love about him. There's such a, uh, a certainty and a peace and a calmness in his teaching. There's a grace in it. And I'll be honest with you, normally when I go on vacation, I don't check in on the service until I get back. You know, it kind of can get my mind spinning out onto things and I don't get to relax. But I love hearing Pastor Jack speak. And so I <clears throat> tuned in on Sunday with the rest of you guys and listened to his message and I really, really, really enjoyed it. So if you didn't tune into that, please do that. You can always go back and watch archive messages and I hope you're keeping up with all that. Hey, exciting stuff. We're beginning a brand new message series today called Next. And I'll be honest with you, this series was a bit of a struggle for me and here's why. Um, as I was closing out the last series, I would get started in my mind on a new series and I just got stuck. And that really doesn't happen to me that often. I'm pretty passionate about a lot of things and I go, this is, this is what I'm gonna talk about next. Well, it, it didn't go that way and I just kept getting stalled and stuck. And I just one day said to Lisa, I go, I cannot figure out what to do next. And then it was like the Holy Spirit just had me pause right there and he said, that's what you're going to talk about next, is how to move on to what's next. Because, man, if there's ever been a time when people were ready to move on to whatever is next, it would be now. Don't you feel that way? I mean, my gosh, it feels like we're getting stuck in the same day over and over and over again. And if anything, things just feel like they're getting a little bit worse than better. And so I asked this question, God, is this what you really mean for us to experience or is there something next waiting for us and if so how can we get there because i truly genuinely believe that there's a better thing waiting for us and it's not waiting until the pandemic's over it's not waiting until the fires are put out that we can begin as followers of christ in our own personal purposes and the promises of god for our personal lives I believe that those are in a, a vacuum. They're unaffected by these circumstances around us. So I started asking the question of myself, man, God, what's next for me? And I want to get there. And how do I chart that path? So I believe for you and I, we're going to start really moving that direction if we're intentional about having a different tomorrow, God's highest and best tomorrow from us. Let me start with the passage of Scripture in Proverbs 6, this is verse 6 through 11. It says, You lazy people, you should watch what the ants do and learn from them. Ants have no ruler, no boss, and no leader. But in the summer, 
Ants gather all their food and save it. So when winter comes, so when the future comes, there is plenty to eat. You lazy people, how long are you going to lie there? When will you get up? You say, I need rest. I think I'll take a short nap. But then you sleep and sleep and become poorer and poorer. Soon you'll have nothing. It will be as if a thief came and stole everything you own. So this passage is clearly warning us that if we are unprepared for our future, right, then when the future arrives, we will be bankrupt. We won't have anything good. We won't even have enough to sustain our needs. It's careless foolishness not to prepare for our future. In other words, don't get trapped in the here and now so that you are unconcerned and unprepared for your future, right? But you might say, well, you know, PC, I'm no scholar, I'm no theologian, I don't have my degree in the Bible, but I did hear what it said. It said lazy people. It really feels like it's talking about somebody who's just not working to prepare for the future, that they're not working to provide for their own needs. And if you said that, you'd be completely correct. You'd be absolutely 100% correct. But here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take some literary license, if I might, some liberty and adjust some of the phrasing in here. I'm not changing scripture. I'm just going to reimagine what it might sound like if we changed a few words in it and expanded the value and the meaning of it, okay? So here it is, my, we'll call it the NI me translation. You stressed out people, you should watch what the ants do and learn from them. Ants have no ruler, no boss, and no leader, but in the summer, the ants gather all their food and save it. So when winter comes, there's plenty to eat. You angry people, how long are you gonna sit there fuming over what's happening around you? When will you get up and move on? You say, well, I need to vent. I think I'll go on a little rant to anyone who will listen. But then you stress and worry and you become angrier and more frustrated with the world around you. Soon you will have nothing. It'll be as if a thief came and stole all your joy or any hope for a future for you. You see, I don't think that God would be angry if you and I took that passage from Proverbs and took our circumstances, whatever it is that's keeping us stuck in this moment, stuck in today, and keeping our focus out of tomorrow, out of our highest and best future, whatever is next, because that is a huge problem for you and I, especially when the circumstances are what they are around us. It's hard not to be focused on those things. It's easy to get ourselves trapped in something that's keeping us focused on the here and now, instead of on God's highest and best future for us. So over the next few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to chart a path from where we're at into God's highest and best tomorrow for us. How do we get to what's next for us? But before we do that, we're honestly going to have to step back for a second and just find out what keeps us trapped in repeating today's over and over and over again. So go ahead and grab your notes if you don't already have those out, and we're going to go on this journey together. I'm excited about this series. I hope you are too. All right, we keep repeating today over and over again because, number one, fill this in, we are unequipped to focus on the now and the next at the same time. We're unequipped to focus on the now and the next at the same time. So I recently saw this meme, I think it was on Facebook, and it said, I think we can all agree that no one in 2015 correctly answered the question, where do you see yourself in five years? And that is 100% true, none of us got that right. And I bet today, if I asked you the question, where do you see yourself in five weeks, in five months, maybe even in five days, probably most of us would not even get that right. It's because that circumstances are changing so rapidly around us and it feels like it's getting more and more chaotic and it makes us feel, listen, it makes us feel unsure and insecure and uncertain. And when we feel that way, we start feeling overwhelmed. And when we feel overwhelmed, it begins to impact how we act today. When we get overwhelmed about the future, 
It changes the way we act today. And here's what I mean by that. It actually affects our faith. It affects the question of whether or not we believe that God truly holds our future in his hands, whether we truly or not believe that God has our highest and best plan for us. You know, the Bible does promise that God knows our future, that God has planned our future, and that God wants to prosper us and not hurt us. But you and I have a tendency that when we feel insecure and overwhelmed about our future, we begin to implement the, the plan B, the emergency backup plan. Well, we're not the first to do that. Some of you remember the story of Israel when Moses had led the Israelites out of captivity. It's really slavery. God delivered them through Moses' leadership out of captivity and slavery to Egypt. And they were traveling and they were moving towards God's promises, right? They hadn't yet reached it. They were moving towards God's promises and they began to grow in their faith. Actually, they had a very difficult time growing in their faith. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to make. They were struggling because they were in captivity, used to sort of fending for themselves and meeting their own needs. But God was calling them to a place of stretching their faith, expanding their faith, and having the ability to trust him in their future, their uncertain future. And they were starting to complain that their needs weren't being provided in a way that made them feel secure. And so God gave them a promise. Listen, I'm going to give you food every single day. You just need to trust me. And as a matter of fact, you need to trust me to the degree that I'm going to give you enough for today, but not enough for today and tomorrow. And that was extremely frustrating for many of them. Listen to what happened in Exodus 16, 19 through 20. Don't try and keep any of it, manna, this bread that God would rain down from the sky. Don't try to keep any of it until morning. Either eat it all or throw it away. But some people ignored Moses and tried to keep some of it until the next morning. Does that sound like you? Sometimes it sounds like me, where I know the promises of God, but instead of listening to the promises of God, I try to hold back something just in case God's not going to be true to his promise. Moses, uh, they ignored Moses and tried to keep some of it until the next morning. Overnight, it became wormy. Some translation says it was filled with maggots and started to have a dreadful smell. Moses became furious with them because they had disobeyed God's instructions. I want to tell you this. Anytime you and I try to put our plan B in place instead of God's promises for our future, it's going to get wormy and smell bad because we cannot create something that matches and meets the grandeur, the size, the, the, the importance of God's promises. for, And God wants it to rot right in front of us so that it helps remind us that his promises are true and whatever we come up with will not suffice. One of the greatest steps into what's next for us is trusting fully in God's promises of the future so that we can make the right decisions today, right here, right now. Number two is this. We keep repeating today over and over because... Number two, we keep trusting someone else to know more about the future than God does. We keep trusting someone else to know more about the future than God does. So when we get discouraged or disappointed or we feel defeated by where our life currently is, and it doesn't have to be all this stuff that's going on, it could be financial difficulty, it could be just disappointment in your relationships and some of your friendships or lack of friendships and your marriage and your career aspirations, whatever it is, you're dissatisfied and you're discontent and you're defeated, we start wanting someone to come along and reassure us that everything's going to be okay, that things are going to get better. We all, listen, we all had that person in our life when we were a child or a teenager, someone that would come along. It was a parent or a grandparent or a trusted friend, maybe even a pastor, who would put their arm around us and just say, hey, it's not boy, you're just making it sound a lot worse than it is. It's a lot better than you think it is. It's going to be okay. We want someone to tell us that the future looks better. We want that in adulthood. We want people to somehow predict the future and tell us that it's going to be okay. But 
listen, your parents, your pastor, your friends have no better insight into the future than you do. They're being reassuring and they're being as helpful as they can, but we're trusting they know something about the future that we don't. How do you think politicians got to where they are now? They've spent their entire careers making promises about the future that they couldn't possibly fulfill because they don't know the future. They say they're going to make things better. They say that they're going to fix these problems. Listen, if that were true, wouldn't they have done it already? They have access to billions of dollars in tax money. They have all the force of the federal government to fix anything they want, and yet they still don't. They make promises like, listen, this is what's going to happen next. All the things you're mad about, I'm going to make all those things go away. We're going to get rid of those because that's the America I believe in. And all the things that you don't have yet, but you want those things, I'm going to make sure you get those because that's what's promised to every American. If you've been around long enough, you know that that's not how it works. If they could do it, they would do it, but they can't, so they won't. And the Bible says that we're foolish for believing any person that thinks they know the future or that they've mapped out a plan for the future without first consulting the heart and the will of God. Only God knows the future. If you're a follower of Christ, you should know that. So let me read this passage of scripture to you. This is out of James 4, 13 through 17. It's in your notes. It's going to be on the screen right there. But I encourage you, look it up later. Highlight it in your Bible. Listen carefully. Those of you who make your plans and say, we're traveling to this city in the next few days and we'll stay there for one year while our business explodes and revenue is up. I've read this passage before because it's such a good passage. The reality is you have no idea where your life will take you tomorrow. You're like a mist that appears one moment and then vanishes another. It would be best to say, if it's the Lord's will and we live long enough, we hope to do this project or pursue this dream. But your current speech, listen, 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 your current speech indicates an arrogance that does not acknowledge the one, capital O, that's God, the one who controls the universe. And this kind of big talking is the epitome of evil. So if you know the right way to live and ignore it, it is sin, plain and simple. Did you catch that? Oh my goodness, it's so full of good truth. Listen, you don't know the future. I don't know the future. Politicians don't know the future. People you trust and love don't know the future. And when you and I go blazing into the future based on some reassurance that we've made to ourselves or someone's made to us, we have to remind ourselves that there is one and one only that knows the future, and that's God. So wouldn't we want to be right in the middle of his will for the future and consult him and say, listen, if it's the Lord's will, I'm going to do this. And if it's not the Lord's will, I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to be spared from that because I don't want to ever live outside of God's will for my life. The Bible actually says it is one of the most anti-Christ, sin-fueled, arrogant, evil things that you and I could possibly do is talking about what we plan on doing in the future instead of talking about the plan of God for our future. And that actually leads us to the third and final point, and that's this. We keep repeating today over and over because, number three and finally, we try to focus on what's next instead of who's next. Let me say that again. We try to focus on what's next instead of Who's next? So here's why it's so easy to get focused and stuck on the here and the now, because the here and the now can easily be measured by tokens and toys and, and, and symbols that help us measure and track our success to help us know how well 
things are going or how poorly things are going. We have the stock market or interest rates or inflation or unemployment numbers or employment numbers to tell us how well the general economy is going, how everyone's doing financially, and then we can kind of measure ourselves against that. We have our own savings accounts or our 401k balances or our pay stubs or our uh, uh, cars, our houses, our, our jet skis, our campers, our clothes, our, our vacations, anything that we can accumulate, we have those things to symbolize how well we personally are doing, whether we're as successful as we should be. And then, of course, if you're uncertain about that, there are advertisements and commercials and social media to show us what you should have that you don't have that you need to get in order to help you feel more successful because successful, beautiful, pretty people have these things, do these things, dress this way. So that is why it's so easy for you and I to get caught in the here and the now because there's a lot of flashy stuff in the here and the now that help keep us distracted. And so when we look into the future, the future might intimidate us because we don't know what the future looks like, right? So we don't even have the time, we don't even have the energy to really focus on what's next because we wanna focus on the things uh, that make us feel successful. So biggest problem is this, the what is always shifting. Um, it's always moving, the target is uh, always unattain <coughs> pardon me, unattainable and unreachable. Uh, that makes us feel frustrated. So we feel like if we can accumulate as many things as possible or, or, or collect as many what's as possible, then we've reached that level of success so that the shifting never really truly affects us. So we say, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna afford this thing? Uh, how am I gonna be able to uh, teach the kids and work? And if we can get that figured out, boy, we are super mom or super dad. If we can go on vacation and still have the kids distant learn while they're on vacation, man, we're even better than we thought we were. If we can buy this thing and still afford to do this thing, man, we are super successful. Um, if I can get this promotion in the middle of a slumping economy at our work, then I am really getting my act together. If I can um, do this thing and make me feel happy in my marriage when everyone else's marriage seems to be struggling around me. So there are a lot of what's that keep us distracted. And if you don't have enough what's in your life, there's plenty of what's in your kids' lives, right? You got to have them involved in this and they got cheated of this because of COVID and they can't do this. And so we try to compensate and we try to make up for it. You're getting my point that we're just obsessed with the what's and we're very unconcerned with the who. And here's what I mean by that. We rarely ask this question. How do I ensure that God is having his way in this decision that I need to make? and the choice I need to make about finances and the decision we're going to make about buying a car or a house or enrolling our kids in this school or choosing this time to go on vacation or choosing to spend our money in this way. Um, how am I sure that God is having his way in this decision I'm getting ready to make for this family? Whose will is being done in this moment, mine, or his, I, I want you to pause right now and ask this question. How often do you start with, every decision start with, God, is this my will or is this yours? Lord, how do I ensure that you're having your will, that this is your plan and not my plan? Ask yourself this, when's the last time you said, whose future am I focused on? Am I focused on the future that God has planned for me before the foundations of the earth were even set into place? Or am I focused on the future I planned three weeks ago for myself? You see, those are the kind of questions that help us focus on the who, whose will, whose plan. Let me close with this passage, Proverbs 19, 21. We humans, that's a pretty comforting thing to be included and all of us seem to have this difficulty. We keep brainstorming options and plans, but God's purpose prevails. Don't you wanna bet on the winning horse? Don't you wanna put all your eggs 
in that basket? Don't you want to trust that God's plan is better than your plan? I know I certainly do. I've done it a million times where I've tried it my way. It's failed. I come out wounded and I go back to God, humble and broken, and I say, God, I need you to fix what I broke. And I could have avoided all of that had I gone with the who instead of the what, if I had just trusted God's plan instead of my own. Listen, beginning next week, we're going to start charting out that path. We're going to start moving towards our highest and best tomorrow. But it's important that we recognize, humbly recognize why you and I get stuck. Can I pray for you? And maybe you're going to want to pray this same prayer, or maybe you're going to have your own prayer that you need to pray to sort of center yourself in God's plan and his purposes and his promises for you. But maybe you'll want to use these words as well. Christ Jesus, we need your hope. We need your forgiveness. We need your mercy. We need your patience. And we need faith. We need an increase in our faith to trust your plans and your purposes for our lives. It's so easy for us to get distracted, to focus on the here and now. When we get uncomfortable to get overwhelmed and we put plan B into action before we've ever given plan A, which there really is only one plan that works and that's yours. You are plan A. You are now and you are what's next. And if we can stay in the rhythm of trusting you in every moment, even especially when things get uncertain and overwhelming, that's when our faith truly comes to life and that's when we truly see your promises being fulfilled. And so that's our prayer over us, over our spouse, over our kids, over our marriages, over our finances, over school, over work, over circumstances, over everything we value and everything that we get distracted by. We pray your will. We pray your plan. And we pray our faith allows us to live in trust and hope and joy in not only today, but in what's next for us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Be back here next week. And if you haven't already signed up for a gear group, we are beginning this coming week. Tuesday nights, Lisa and I are going to be leading Love and Respect right here at our church offices. And there are tons of different gear groups to get involved in the story. That is a Um, a story form of the Bible. So if you need to fall in love with God's word, this is a great group to get involved with. You can go to an in-person group. You can go to a a Zoom group, or you can actually go to the on-demand group, which is part of our online campus. But you can find all those on the app or on the website. Do that. You need to stay connected, especially those of you who are in our online campus. It's easy to drift from relationship. Get involved in an Uh, a gear group today. God bless you guys. We'll see you back here next week.
That is who you are. That is who you are. That is.